All of us are familiar with the model of Catholic education in which schools claim for themselves the distinction of being Catholic by virtue of the fact that they have a religion course added to the roster of otherwise secular subjects. There's math, science, social studies, English, and also a catechism class. By the mere fact that the religion class is an addition, the message is conveyed that it doesn't really relate to the other subjects. The truth is, though, that all academic disciplines speak of the glory of God, even those popularly considered to be opposed to the matters of faith, like math or science, there are all sorts of examples of how math and science reveal God's nature and mind. What I propose to do here, however, is to use three famous works of art in order to illustrate specifically how geometry speaks of the truth of man and the truth of God. St. Martin and the Beggar by El Greco was originally commissioned for the chapel of San Jose in Toledo, Spain, but now hangs in the National Gallery in Washington. The story it images is popularly familiar. Martin, a member of the Roman Imperial Calvary Station in Gaul, meets a shivering beggar at the city gates of Amiens and impulsively wields his sword to cut his cloak in half. Using the severed half to cover the beggar, the painting obviously does not try to depict historical details. Its intention, then, is not biographical. Instead, with the help of the lines, we'll find that its purpose is ultimately analogical. It's on a line that starts from the tip of the beggar's right elbow, moves on the bottom of his ribcage, the folds of the cloak, the knee of Martin, the breast strap of his horse, the bottom of the cloak, and to the other side of the canvas, equally at the mountain ridge. The horizontal line effectively divides the canvas into two planes of action. The up plane consisting of the drama involving the beggar and Martin, the lower plane consisting of essentially a mingling of bare legs. In this bottom plane, there are several minor horizontal lines which connect the beggar's legs with the horse's legs. Both sets bare, both elongated, and exactly the same length. Horizontal lines coupled with the effects of imagery tell the viewer that Martin is connected to the beast, as the horizontal lines literally connect to his legs of the horses, or more literally, Martin equals animal. Above the main horizontal line, the viewer finds an upside down bee, the two legs of which rest on the ends of the horizontal line. While its peak is at the top of Martin's head, the rising Gothic structure encompasses the Martin Beggar drama. Essentially, it takes up the animality of the painting's lower half and lifts it towards the heavens. The lines then do not leave the beggar on level with his horse, but lift him and his nakedness up to a level with Martin, whose lace and iron image of, of a blend of grace and strength. The lines assure us, moreover, that these are not earthly virtues that Martin embodies, but that they belong to the open heavens to which the lines point. The painting finally even specifies the means by which the beggar's animal nature, which we all share, is lifted towards the heaven. The answer is the diagonal line of the cloak, half held by Martin, half held by the beggar. In the story's context, the green cloak is the image of charity. Since it is the means of charity, the act of charity becomes, then, not merely the connection between Martin and the beggar, but also with the blue infinite transcendence of God. Caravaggio's conversion of Saul illustrates a profound yet initially puzzling use of geometry. The use of the line is not as intricate as that in El Greco's painting. Upon initial viewing of the Caravaggio, one immediately recognizes a dominant circle. The bottom bowl of the circle is formed by Saul's chest and upraised arms. Then as the circle line leaves the tip of Saul's right thumb, it follows the horse's arched head and neck, comes around the shoulder, picks up with the bend of the horse's right leg, then completes its journey along Saul's left hand and arm. 
To put it more simply, though less exactly, see the concave shape of the horse poised over the convex shape of saw. Now, as for straight lines in the painting, we have a dominant horizontal and a dominant vertical. The point of intersection for both is zero, zero on a coordinate plane, so to speak, is the horse's hoof. A horse's hoof is furthermore at the center of the circle we have already traced. Rather emphatically, then, the lines tell us that the focus of the painting, oddly, is not Saul at all. A contemporary complaint, in fact, after Caravaggio had completed the painting, had to do with the predominance of the horse's rump. Very obviously, the focus on the hoof is deliberate. The characteristic of the painting puzzled me for days after I began its serious study. Theoretically, the painting narrates a moment of divine revelation, a moment of light, of authority, of clarity. In the canvas's center, however, as the dirtiest part of the common beast of labor. But then I thought, who was Saul? An Orthodox Jew? A man doctrinally convinced that God is completely transcendent and that this notion of God becoming eminent, of God becoming flesh, was utterly impossible. That is to answer my own question, offer the solution to the hoof. The hoof is flesh. It is flesh poised above, above Saul's chest, so that the strong light of God's revelation illuminating Saul's face, there was also a plain, heavy, dirty foot looming over his chest. Saul's realization is that the two are now one, that the transcendent has become imminent, that the God is really part of the dirty, sinful world, and that it is God whom Saul persecutes. We see a third illustration of a very deliberate use of lines in a less famous work by Edward Hopper, one called 7 a.m., which Hopper completed six years after the well-known Nighthawks. The method of 7 a.m., however, is essentially the same as that of Nighthawks. A central vertical line sets up two contrasting sides. On the left is a dark, somewhat ominous wood. On the right is a crisp, efficient storefront. The lines also tell us that these two sides are in a way talking to each other. We notice how the horizontal lines in the tree branches flow to the horizontal lines in the store's wooden siding. Answering images on each side pick up the same conversation. Three tree trunks in the forefront of the wood setting are echoed by three columns at the store's front. The shape of the foliage, moreover, with its peak at the left side of the canvas, nears the peak of the store's awning. The details on each side of the central vertical, however, while they are similar in shape and line, also point out the central contrast between two sides. While, there, while the tree trunks are twisted and irregular, the three white columns are straight and prim. While the branches sway with force of the wind, the building's siding stays properly regular. In other words, nature is in movement and somewhat mysterious, while man's commercial world is regular, ordered, yet empty. To a great extent, Hopper was correct. Man's commercial world is empty. For us, numbers and lines have no mystery or meaning in themselves. They're only tools for calculation. When we remember, though, that the word was made flesh, then we begin to consider the possibility that all aspects of creation speak of him, who became part of the material, mortal realm. Trees, beams, physical processes, even our dull geometry, all now attest to the one who made them, and at least in the material sense, even became one of them.